Lord, we, we think of the words to that song as we listen to Jenny lead us in worship. And uh, that is our goal, to be able to really walk with you and talk with you any time, any moment of our life. And we know, Lord, that when we come to this place, that it's special. It's a, a time in our week when we can set aside the busyness of life, when we can take these few minutes and, and spend them more directly in your presence, that we can find our, our way to you a little easier. And for that, we are so thankful. So this morning, Lord, we just pray that in our time of worship that each one of us will meet you face to face. Each one of us will feel your presence so specially in our life that you will speak to us, that you will comfort us, that you will draw us nearer to you each moment. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for the promise that wherever two or more are gathered, you are in our midst. And we welcome you here this morning. Amen. How about if we stand and put on our little kids' hearts and let's sing, Jesus loves me this morning. Emmy? Emerson, I need some help. Eva? I need some help. Come and come and help us sing Jesus Loves Me. Will you? Come on, Myla. You can come too. All of you. Come on. chocolate. <laughs> of course chocolate. All right, now let's sing I Love to Tell the Story, number 156, or on the screen.
before you sit down, go find somebody and say good morning. We haven't done that for a while. Take a minute to do that. I need, before everybody gets set down, I need a couple of ushers to come forward and we'll gather the morning offering. <laughs> It'd be heavier. Father God, we thank you for these gifts and offerings that you have uh, received in, in these plates this morning. We pray that in our giving we will know that we're reaching into the world and making a difference. In our giving that we are honoring you. In our giving that we are showing the world what an awesome God we serve. Accept these gifts, accept these offerings, Lord, and use them however you need in order to make your kingdom grow here on earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Youngins, come on back up here and talk to me for a little bit. Fun. Come on. Come on, girls. The boys are beating you this morning. Come on. Come on over here. Come over here. Sit on the, in the middle here so everybody can see you. They want to be able to see you. You're so handsome. I need you to come this way. Oh, I guess I can go over that way, can't I? I can do that. I'm flexible. Hey, does anybody ever have dreams? Do, any of you, do you have dreams at night? What do you dream? Um, I dream about riding a motorcycle and driving a plane. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
in a tank. Woo, don't knock it off. Okay. Okay, a monster truck and a tank. That's a pretty big dream. You girls dream? Any of you girls ever have dreams at night? What do you dream about? Can you read? Nothing. Ah, that's a good thing. Yes. What? Listen, listen, listen. Oh, a catfish trying to eat you. That would be a nightmare. Oh, really? Do you know when I was a kid, I had a dream. I had a what? Oh, really? They do that. I had a dream when I was a kid one time, and I would have it more than one time. I'd have it maybe two or three times a week. Do you ever have the same dream? Let me tell you about my dream. I dreamt that I was in a boat, just a rowboat kind of boat, and I was out in the middle of a lake, and the, the lake was perfectly calm. Have you ever seen a lake or a pond like that where the, the wind's not blowing and there's, there's no waves, no ripples, just really... I didn't have an oar. I didn't have a paddle. I was just stuck out in the middle of this lake, and it really began to bother me because I, I needed to get in the shore. And... Every time I would have that dream, I would wake up with kind of a panicky feeling and I'd have to go to the bathroom. I was sleeping, but I had that same dream. It, I couldn't get there, but I needed to really bad. <laughs> so, you know, people have dreams. And I want to tell you about a dream that a guy in the Bible had, okay? His name was Jacob, and he had a dream. He was out he was on a trip, actually. Listen, girls, listen. Jacob was on this trip, and he, he, they didn't have hotels back then. Come here. Come here. Just sit still, okay? Just sit still. They didn't have hotels. So he just got this big rock, and he pulled it up, and he laid it in one spot, and that's what he used for his pillow. Does that sound like a comfortable pillow? Doesn't me either, but that's what he used. And he had this dream, and his dream was he saw a ladder that went all the way from earth to heaven. And he, he saw angels going up and down. Are you, are you guys listening, huh? You girls listening? Angels were, go, uh, angels were going up and down. But do you know who was at the top of the ladder? Oh, look at you guys. You're smart, aren't you? Yeah, God was up there. And Jacob was so excited that he took that pillow, that big rock that he had, and he poured oil on it, which was a way of making it special. And he said, from now on, this place is called Bethel. Can you say Bethel? Bethel. Bethel, Bethel means God's place. And he said, this is holy ground. Wherever God is, is holy ground. Okay? So he had a dream that we all can kind of tap into. Because do you know what? God is in this place. He meets us here every Sunday morning. Do you ever, do you ever feel God? Yeah, I do too. In your heart. Oh, Brooks, you make my heart. Oh, my gosh. Yep, he's walking around in our hearts. And that's amazing. So I am glad we've got this place that's holy ground because we know we can meet God here, but we can meet him anywhere. We don't have to be in church to meet him, okay? All right, let's pray. Can we pray? Hmm? Father, I thank you for these little ones. They bring real life into our midst, and we are so thankful for that. And I just pray, Lord, that you will help them to sense your presence in their life as they grow. Each day, I pray that they'll meet you in somewhere special, and they'll know that they're standing on holy ground. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. You need a hand up? You don't? I do. <laughs> okay, let's go. Don't turn around and go. I'll run into you. Thank <laughs> you.
walking around in my heart. Oh my God. Mm. Okay. Mm. What kind of praises do you have this week? Mm. Where have you where have you met God? Where are you? I want to thank everybody for the calls, the texts, the visits, the cards, the flowers, the prayers, the love, the everything, the food, the signs. I have felt very blessed this week. We love you. We love your family. I, I felt it. Good. For sure. Good. Your mom was a special one lady. We're so sorry, you know, for your loss, but mm-hmm. we know where she's at and she's in a much better place. So. Yeah. Others? Sandy? Well, um, this week I think that we all saw that God has a sense of humor. That on Halloween, it snowed. <laughs> 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 and, and, and as the, the fire trucks were going up and down the streets, and, and they changed their music from Ghostbusters and Halloween music to It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody that helped with that, too. That, that, that's a big job. And the kids' eyes were huge when we handed them these little bags of candy yeah. instead of just the pieces. They really were excited, but I have to tell you the best story, I think, of all. This little guy, he was probably, no, he might have been a second grader. I don't know his name at all. Oh, yeah. Um, we handed him uh, a bag of candy, and every, all the other kids were going, wow, that's a bag of candy. He went, yay! And we all kind of sat because it was just, he was so excited. He said, there's a worm in my candy. <laughs> We were so excited for the Bible or the bookworm that Ruth had made for everybody that we put in their bag. He said, I have, I just finished reading, I think it was Ghostbusters, the book, I don't remember what he said, but anyhow, he just had finished reading the book and left his worm in the book, and he needed a new worm, so he was glad to get it. I, I just, it just touched my heart, you know, that he was excited about that bookworm. So. I also have, um, Chelsea, that we've been praying for, she is home and doing well. They did get off the cancer, and they did get to hook her back up, so so she doesn't have to have an ostomy. Good. And Good. so she is in pain still, but she she's recovering and doing well. Yeah. So the outcome may be really good for her. Yes. Good. Any other praises? Farming's coming okay, Judy. I heard him say, heard him say they were done with beans last weekend, so they're probably running corn real hard now. Corn now. All right. All right. Are there prayer concerns? Oh, well, go ahead. My, what is my brother-in-law, Tim. Um, he's got a lot of problems, <laughs> and so he's still in the hospital. So. He needs prayer for my sister Peggy. She got called one o'clock in the morning, and he said they were remodeling his room, and she needed to come up and get these people out of his room. So he's having hallucinations, and it's it's hard to deal with. So they both he needs prayer for healing, and she needs <coughs> prayer just yeah. to get her through all this with him. Okay, Tim and Peggy. Yeah. I did talk with uh, with. Uh, Jack just talked with him. He texted me a little while ago and said that Ruth got to come home last night. Um, they are giving her some medication for her stomach. They don't think that there's a, a, a ruptured ulcer or anything, but there is something going on and there'll be more tests probably. So, But she did get to come home. They were really tired and ready to maybe get some sleep. So. Any others? Anything else? Uh, can you pray for mom? Okay, Jerry. Yes, Frank. Uh, we've asked for prayers for many of our staff members that I work with. We had an incident Halloween over in Cleveland, and one of our one of my coworkers unfortunately fell out of a boat and drowned. <laughs> and uh, one of my best friends was he was there when it happened, so. He's pretty shook up about it. Um, his name is Tyler Webb. He's only been here for since May. And, uh, my friend Patrick Wagner 
here and lost his own life trying to get after him. So they're having myself go over there this week to help. But I know it, it is the first fatality in our company's history, so it's got a lot of people concerned. I mean, I've done this so many years now, and I've not wanted to, so I've never come back to the bank alive, so it's, it's got people I'm spoken. Hungry counseling is heavy. That's hard. Well, that's, yeah, that's all. Mm -hmm. It's all about this. You know, if we have young kids too. Mm -hmm. um, and I was hoping to serve them on Thursday. Okay. And yeah. we have the concert on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> One day at a time. For Martha and Adam. Mm. Mm. Yeah. For our oldest daughter um, being home, and for Paul. Okay. What's her name? Allie. Allie? Okay. Huh? Let's do some praying then. Father, thank you for this family that we're surrounded with, that we can lay before them these hurts and concerns and prayer needs and know that they will be lifted up all week long. They'll be brought before you and and laid out before you several times over this next week and that brings us a real sense of peace and it makes us feel so loved by these human beings that we call church family as well as being loved by you our list is kind of long this morning we want to lift up tim and Peggy, as they deal with this, this issue right now, we pray for healing for Tim. We pray for strength and patience for Peggy. It's a hard time and a hard thing they're going through. We think of Loretta's family and their loss and, and their past few days as they've felt the love of the community that they've lived in all their lives as they've experienced what a little corner of heaven's going to feel like someday when all of our friends and family are right there to um, comfort us to uh, walk alongside us with whatever we're going through we want to lift up Jerry and we ask, Lord, that you would just touch her body and help relieve the pain. I know that's something that she deals with every day. And it's a hard, that's a hard, heavy thing to carry. So we just ask for a relief for her. We want to lift up Ruth. We don't know exactly what's going on yet with Ruth, but we just know that we miss her here and we know that she doesn't have any patience with being ill and, and needing to slow down. So, Lord, we just pray that you will touch her and help her to help her to heal and get stronger and be back in our midst as quickly as possible. We pray for Jenny's. This is going to be a, a busy and, and perhaps a long week for her as she gets ready, gets the kids ready for concert Tuesday and, and then the consultation with the surgeon on Thursday. We pray that um, they'll be able to get her in for the surgery quickly and that it will help her to feel so much better afterwards. We want to lift up Martha and Adam. Uh, 
friends of our community, Lord, that uh, are going through some really difficult times right now. We pray for your healing touch upon their lives. We pray for Paul. He, too, carries a lot of pain, and that's a, a hard day to wake up to, to know that there's going to be an excessive amount of pain to cope with and deal with. So just ease that, Lord, and give him, give him some relief. We pray for Allie. We pray that now that she's home, that um, things will settle in for her. She'll be able to move forward and get her life uh, go in the direction she wants to go. And Lord, we think of this horrible accident at Frank's work. We pray for the family of the young man that lost his life. We pray comfort and, and we just know that uh, they don't walk alone in this pain. We want to lift up the the young man that uh, he tried to rescue him, and he needs to feel, Lord, like um, he did all he could do, and that the, the outcome was not his fault, that, that it was the circumstance of the moment. And we just pray for him to find peace. We ask, Lord, that this week you go with Frank, especially to help him. Show others how to rely on you and to let you carry the hurt and the pain that they're feeling so that they can move forward in their lives without a lot of residual hurt. Give him strength, give him the right words, help him to feel your presence in his life so that he knows he's offering them Jesus in a way that makes a difference to them. And Lord, be with each of us as we uh, go about our everyday life. Help us to, to know that we serve an awesome God, one that will listen to our needs and, and he will take into consideration our requests and, and he works through and for us to make things better for us. And Lord, as, as a family of God, it brings us peace and joy and comfort to be able to gather and, and to pray the way we've been taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you'd like to either take out your hymnal or look on the screen up front, we'll sing, I Need Thee Every Hour.
I am not going to um, read our full scripture this morning ahead of time. I'm going to I'm going to read most of it to you and talk about it as we go along in the sermon. We are <coughs> excuse me. We're on Genesis 28 and in, in 20 the 28th chapter already. We've only got 3 more weeks to go. Do you know that? And we'll pretty well have gone through not the whole book of Genesis, but the the first part of it for sure. Um we're going to look at a character this week a little more closely that we kind of got introduced to last week. And my goodness, he is quite a character. His name is Jacob. Uh, remember in the ancient Hebrew, the name Jacob literally means heel grabber. He grabs the heel. And um, in the, the kind of the slang of the day back then, that meant a deceiver, someone that deceived easily. Last week we saw how uh, manipulative he was, especially to his older twin brother Esau. Um, remember he, he conned Esau into selling him his birthright uh, for a bowl of soup or stew or something that Esau had made to eat or that Jacob had made to eat. So, And later um, it tells us in Scripture that um, after their father Isaac had pretty well lost his sight and he was nearing death, that he, he, Isaac decided it was time to pass on the parental blessing to, uh, in his mind, the oldest son. That's who it usually went to. Now, um, Isaac was a little bit stubborn about that. Uh, he kind of thought Esau had given up the right for the blessing when he gave up his birthright years before. And um, so he and um, his Jacob and his mother got a little bit conniving and came up with another plan uh, to, to kind of circumvent Jacob. Um, and, and he, you know, he kind of felt like he had a right to that blessing, Jacob did, because Esau gave away his birthright so easily for a bowl of soup, you know. And, and the birthright was so important back then. But we have to think about Isaac a little bit here. You see, Isaac really wanted Esau to have that blessing. And why? Not necessarily because he was a minute or so older. It really was the fact that he favored Esau. He favored Esau. He loved the, the wild game that Esau would bring home and cook for him. He loved the uh, roughness and the, the he-man style that Esau lived. And we kind of get the impression that Jacob was a, a little more of a mama's boy through the whole story. So... Um, that may be, and we're not here to, to talk about the parenting styles of this couple, but um, I got a feeling that this playing favorites had a little bit to do with the uh, dysfunction of their family. So uh, you might want to store that away somewhere. If you're still raising kids, you might want to store that away somewhere in your memory bank. <laughs> Don't do that. Well, anyhow... Uh, we come to our story today uh, about the, the uh, parental blessing. And um, Esau was pretty sure he was, you know, since he was the oldest, he was going to get the blessing. And Jacob was pretty sure that he wasn't going to get the blessing, that Jacob was going to get it. So he and his mother, Rebecca, came up with this plan where they would prepare a soup or a stew that would emulate something that Esau would have brought home for Rebecca to make and that um, Jacob would put on this furry costume kind of thing so that his dad, Isaac, who was nearly blind and really close to death at this time, would not be able to tell that it was not Esau offering him the soup. In other words, he would, they, this was a really... Uh, detailed plan. It wasn't just something that 
popped into their head and they just thought, oh, well, it won't matter anyhow. We can just sneak this by Dad and he won't know. You have to understand a little bit about this paternal blessing. It really was a fundamental part of the ancient rit tradition. It was considered irrevocable. Once, once the father placed his hand upon that son's head and gave that blessing, he couldn't say, oops, wrong kid, never mind, I want this one. Couldn't do that. It was irrevocable. It was considered to be um, a pronouncement that was life-altering because it was saying that this is the son that's going to inherit two-thirds of my estate no matter what the rest of them got. Esau, when all this came about, Esau was furious. He felt like he had just fallen victim to another one of Jacob's heel-grabbing kind of schemes, so he decided that it was time to stand up and take care of this whole mess. And so he made some pretty open threats. Scripture tells us Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given to him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. After his death, I will kill my brother Jacob. Now, Jacob heard about Esau's anger. And he decided it was time to get the heck out of Dodge because this was getting scary. Esau was really mad now. And so Jacob decided to, um, that it was time for him to find a wife and settle down. And the best place for him to get a wife was to go back to his father's homeland area and find a wife from some of their extended relatives. We've talked about that before. That's pretty well how most of them uh, found their wives was to go back to the, the old country, so to speak, and, and take a wife. So uh, Jacob left Beersheba and he headed for the region of Paddan Aram. And there um, he was going to visit with his uncle Laban. Now, if you remember a couple weeks ago, I mentioned Laban. He was Rebecca's brother. He's the one that perked all up when he found out that Rebecca was going to marry into this really rich family. I think well, you're going to get to know him even better next week in our series, so hang on to, to his name. <coughs> but today's story is about Jacob's journey back to that homeland. And it was a life-altering journey. And I think there's some things that we can learn from that because I think every one of us needs to um, experience that transformational moment in our lives. So let's see if we can find some, some takeaways from this story that will, uh, that will make our walk with Jesus even better. With his life in danger, Jacob set out on his journey. He left Beersheba headed toward the city of Haran. Haran. Um, and on the first night out, he found a place to set up camp, and he stopped there for the night. Like I told the kids, he chose a stone for a pillow. I don't know why, but that was what he chose. And he was able to go to sleep. But he had a dream. It was about a stairway that reached from earth to heaven, and it tells us there were angels going up and down the steps, and at the top of the stairway was God himself. And this is what God said to him in his dream. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you, and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. If that sounds familiar, it's because it really is. That's basically the same promise that God had spoken to Abraham and then to Isaac. 
And now, it, now it's Jacob's time. It's his time to hear and to believe and to obey. It says Jacob woke up and, and he remembered the dream. And his response was to say, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And I didn't even know it. And so he set out to make some choices and some changes in his life. What, what happened to Jacob as he slept under that open sky? Well, it's the same thing that I pray will happen to every one of us. You could call it the beginning of a new beginning. There are three elements in Jacob's story that we, each one of us, need to experience for ourselves. Because these three elements make up the beginning of a new beginning for us. And at some point in our life, we all need a new beginning. The very first thing that happened in Jacob's life that needs to happen to us, to each one of us, is that we need to know God on a personal level. Jacob grew up knowing about Abraham's God. He grew up knowing about Isaac's God. And he probably heard stories about Noah's God. He knew his people were not like the rest of the Canaanite people all around them. And he knew that their God was nothing like his God or the God of his fathers. But up to this point, we really don't see that Jacob seemed to have much religion on his own. We see no indication that he trusted God to bring about all that God had already promised him. No, up to this point, Jacob wasn't really what you'd call a man of faith or a man of prayer. Up to now, we've seen him be a schemer, a deceiver, a heel grabber. He, he wasn't above using subterfuge or trickery to get what he wanted. But now, here at, at this place, alone in the desert, he kind of faced his moment of truth. The God of all creation came to him and said, in effect, I am the God of your grandfather, the God of your father, and I am your God too. All that I have promised them, I am now promising you. It now belongs to you and your descendants. In verse 15, God said, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised you. At that moment, his father's religion became real to Jacob. It became personal. This needs to happen in all of our lives, each one of us. There needs to be a moment when religion moves from the the general to the specific, from the historical to the personal. We need to be able to say, this is my experience now. He's not merely the God I've heard about or the God I've known a little bit about as I grew up. He's my God. He's here with me. He watches over me. And his promises are real to me. When I say that, that you need to make your relationship with God personal, I'm talking about that moment in which you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You, you give him your heart and your life. You begin a, a new beginning, a new relationship with him. That's how we begin to make knowing God a personal matter. I'm also talking about trusting in his promises every day of your life. Just like God made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, he makes promises to us today, to all of us. Promises such as, I will be with you today wherever you may go. I will give you strength to face what you must face. I will give you peace and joy. I will fill your life with meaning. I will cause everything that happens to work out for good 
in your life. I will hear your prayers and I will answer. I will reward you for your faith and your obedience. I will forgive you for your sins and cover the past with my mercy. I could go on and on and on and on. Our Bible is full of promises. And we need to learn to claim them as our own, our own for today. So many times people go through life thinking that the promises are meant for people back in the Bible time or for somebody else at least. Maybe they're for my parents or maybe they're for my neighbors or okay, well, they're certainly not for me. But they are. They truly are. You can really believe that the promises of God were meant for you. doesn't matter how long you've been a follower of Jesus. If you're not living a promise-filled life today, then it's time to make that relationship personal. It's time to hear what God is saying to you and for you to say in response, Yes, Lord, I believe and I receive it. The beginning of a new beginning means that you make your life a personal thing between you and God. And when that happens, then the second element of Jacob's experience becomes real to you. You recognize the presence of God in your everyday experiences. It'll make it a lot easier for you when I ask, where has God touched your life this week? When Jacob laid down that night, it was just a campsite, a desert spot out there in the middle of the wilderness. But when he woke up a few hours later, he saw things in a different way. Verse 16 and 17 says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Suddenly, that little spot out there in the middle of nowhere was home for God Almighty. Then Jacob performed a ritual. He poured oil on the stone, and he, the, the hard one that he'd used for a pillow, and he called the place Bethel, which means the house of God. In other words, he was saying God lives here. Years later, when God appeared to Moses, remember he said to Moses, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. It's holy ground because God was there. In that sense, we can come today and say that we're standing on holy ground. Where we are right now, it's holy ground because God is here. He's with us in this moment. That's his promise, and he applies it to each of us personally. Sometimes I've heard people say, I try to play, pray, but my prayers only go about as high as the ceiling. No, here's the good news. Your prayers don't have to go higher than the ceiling because the God of heaven is right here with you, right where you are. This is holy ground. Not because we're here. It's holy ground because he's here. Every step we take and every place we lay down our hat, we're on holy ground because the God of heaven is right here with us. Once you become aware of his presence, you see him everywhere. You see him at work in everything. And this is an experience we all need an experience that makes God more real to us every moment. Pretty soon it's easy for us to say, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. The third element of Jacob's experience is that we all need to surrender our life to his lordship. Jacob wasn't content in this moment merely to have a a religious experience. He wasn't willing to be merely to have it be merely a moment in his life. He was ready to make some long-term life-changing decisions. The Bible says beginning in verse 20, then 
Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now it kind of sounds at first like he's trying to strike a bargain with God. But that's not at all what's happening here. Jacob is not bartering. He's simply repeating back to God the promise that God had spoken to him earlier. And he's saying, in effect, okay, Lord, in response to your promise, here's my promise. And his promise came down to very simply, I surrender my life to you from now on. And I really mean it. I really mean it. And then Jacob, that fast talker, he commits in this moment to something more than just mere talk. He says, of all that you have given me, I will give you a tenth. In other words, he's giving real something back to God. It's not just his emotions that he's giving. It's not just his way of thinking it's giving. He's ready to back up his words with an action. I think we talked in Bible study here a while back about how the things that we are committed to will show up on a line in our checkbook or several lines in our checkbook. We give to what we are committed to. And that's what Jacob was saying. It's going to give you back a tenth of everything. Because I'm serious about this. Jacob's experience is the same experience that every one of us needs to have. It's that moment of surrender when we, we give our life to our Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to come into our hearts and to forgive us our sins. And then, you know, we can't just, we can't just say that. We have to go a little bit further. We have to include something like, I'm not playing games. I really mean this. It's, it's this kind of I surrender and I mean business mentality that leads to a promise-filled life. We can't just make our religion be a, a Sunday morning something. It has to be who we are. It has to change who we are. We'll notice in the weeks to come as we finish up our, our study that Jacob still isn't perfect, but he is different from this point on. God is doing a work in Jacob that will continue all of Jacob's life. Just like us. You know, God is doing a work in each one of us. He didn't and he won't make us perfect overnight. But here is his promise found in the book of Philippians, spoken through the Apostle Paul. It says, And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. It's a lifelong process, my friends. It doesn't happen overnight. But this process, begun with intention and carried out with determination, is the key to a life filled with the promises of God. It began for Jacob in that moment when he realized that God was there for him. In that moment when his faith became personal and real to him. It's that way for us, too. The moment in which we make it personal, the moment in which we acknowledge God at work in our lives, that moment when we surrender with a, I mean, business attitude, this is when we experience the beginning of a new beginning. When you're ready to say, I'm His, He is here, and here I stand. Communion is a perfect time to make this kind of commitment, either for the first time or as a recommitment 
of the promise you made years ago. Remembering what Jesus did for you will help you make that decision once again. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he had gathered his followers around him. He met them at the table. And he had some difficult words for them. Words that they didn't want to hear. Words I'm sure he didn't really want to speak either. Words that said things that will be different before long. He took the bread that they had at the table. He broke that bread and he said, every time you have a meal, every time you break bread, every time you eat bread, remember, remember that my body will be broken for you. I'm going to do what's coming up for you. He took the, the cup of wine and he told him, he said, this, this is a reminder that my blood is going to be poured out for the forgiveness of sin. My blood will cover all sin. He gave us symbols that we can remember what he's done for us already. At this point, when we take communion, when we receive these elements, it's our way of committing and recommitting each time to allowing him to be our Lord and Savior, to remember the wonderful gift he's given us of eternal life, of remembering that he is the one that we follow every day. So I invite you to come to the table today. Come and recommit your life. Recommit your desire to follow him. To live a life filled with his promises. To be the Christian he's called you to be. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, pour out your blessing upon these common elements of bread and juice. Make them be for us the blood and body of Christ given for us. Help each of us accept this gift of grace and pass it forward to the families and people and world around us. Bless each person as they come and partake of this beautiful gift. Amen. Would you come? Please, come, accept the gift.
How much are you going to claim today that you haven't been claiming? You need to find one that's yours. Take it. It's a gift. Would you pray? Lord, as we go forward into the world, let we let us all share the love we have of you, the certainty we have of you with the world around us. The more people that know of your love, Lord, the better our world will be. It will become a, a happier place. It will become a place for children to grow up in safety and in love and not be as scary as it seems to be some days in the world that we are in now. So let us accept this gift of bread and juice and let it become for us your body, your blood, and us, your hands and feet for the world. Amen. Would you stand with me and we'll close today with I stand amazed in the present.